Hi everybody, welcome along to Left Foot Media. My name is Brendan Malone. If you're new here, why not hit that subscribe button. If you've been following for a while and you're wondering to yourself, Brendan, where has the content been? Look, all I can say is sorry, I'm a busy man, I'm a father, I've got five kids, I've got a very, very busy work life and work schedule, a lot of travel, a lot of speaking in different places. And so my ability to create specifically movie-related content is the time's just not there to be able to give to that as I would love to be able to do right now at this present moment. This is a bit of a labor of love for me that I do more in my spare time than anything else. But the good news is that I'm starting a new show this year called Movies That Matter. And so once a month, there will be a new piece of movie-related content on this channel. If you're interested in this and the other commentary that I do, you can find me at patreon.com forward slash leftfootmedia. And you can follow along and you can support the work that I do there. Lots of other stuff, regular podcasting and others of you who tune into this content know because you're listeners to my podcast as well, which focuses on all sorts of other issues. But today, what I want to do is I want to, uh, I guess, stick my neck out here a little bit. Uh, not really, because there's nothing brave or courageous about uh, critiquing a television show. But I know that a lot of people, the general mainstream consensus has been that episode three of the Last of Us TV series was, you know, one of the most well-crafted things ever seen on TV, uh, one of the greatest love stories ever put to television, etc., etc. That's the kind of reaction that most people seem to be having to the show. And I want to offer a contrarian position. I want to challenge people to stop and to actually reassess whether or not this really is worthy of the hype, whether or not this really is as good as some people are claiming. I'm not just trying to be a contrarian for the sake of it. I found myself increasingly frustrated by this very one-sided commentary, which I think is probably realistically most people, I think, are either enamored by two things. One is the emotionalism of this show has lulled people into not really critiquing too deeply about what else is going on. Or secondly, the sexual politics of this episode have caused people to put their blinders on and completely ignore the obvious flaws in episode three of The Last of Us. So here we go. I'm going to stick my neck on the chopping block and I'm going to push back hard and I'm going to tell you what I think is actually wrong with this episode. And there are several different categories of flaw, if you like, or flaws in the show that I think are worthy of critique. Before I do that, a couple of things. Number one is I should point out there are going to be spoilers, obviously. So if you haven't seen the episode... You don't want anything spoiled. Go away, watch the episode and come back here and then check out this video and see for yourself whether or not you think I've been fair or at least reasoned in my assessment. My hope is that by the end of this, even if you don't agree with me, even if you don't agree with the moral positions I hold, even if you don't agree with some of the things I say about the show, that you will at least see there is reasoning behind what I'm saying. It's not just a reactionary, emotional sort of knee-jerk, oh, I don't like this, kind of thing there's a bit more substance to this critique. The other thing I'll say, and this is important, is I am judging this episode and this show based solely on the merits of the television show. I was not a player, an aficionado, a fan of the game. It just wasn't my thing. I was never into those kind of video games in a big way. I was already married with kids when these sorts of things were starting to happen. So I'm looking at this purely from a storytelling perspective and looking solely at the television show. And I think in some ways that probably gives me a little bit of an advantage because it means that I am not uh, guided in my judgment or having my judgment maybe clouded a little bit by some great love of the pre-existing content, which was the video game. And I think that's what happens. People get uh, nostalgia, they get sentimentality for something, and it can cloud our judgment when we come to uh, examine any sort of adaption or new addition to that particular universe, that particular um, intellectual property, this artistic property that is The Last of Us. And so I'm looking at this and and basing my critique purely based on the merits of the show. And in particular, it's only episode three that I'm interested in here. And there's some things that stuck out to me. So let's start with the basic stuff first, and then we'll get more serious as we go. Because by the end of this, I think I will have made a very sound case for the fact that this is not actually a love story between these two men at all. When you look at what's going on here, it seems pretty obvious to me that Frank is a narcissistic, predatory type of character, and Bill is a genuine guy who has been 
taken advantage of by someone who is narcissistic in their character. And we'll see this, the beginning and the end of their relationship, this is very much played out in some very big and serious ways by the end. Before I get to that point though, let me talk about some of the things that I think when people say things like, this is some of the most well-crafted television I've ever seen. Here's some things that I think would challenge that claim about episode three. And I know some people might accuse me of nitpicking, but the only reason I'm highlighting this stuff is because, precisely because, I think people are talking about this episode as if it is some form of high art that we've never seen on television before. I think their judgment is being clouded either by the emotive manipulation of, of the imagery and the music in the show, or by maybe a nostalgic love of the game and the characters, or because of the sexual politics in this show. And I think if you can, and try and put those things aside, you realize that this is typical average TV drama. It's got cheese, it's got these sort of hallmark sentimentality moments, it's also got some holes in it, and normally that wouldn't be an issue because when you're watching cheesy average TV dramas, you don't tend to nitpick like this, you just go, oh look, it's just an average TV drama, enjoy the fundamentals on screen and don't pay too much attention to the details because that's not really what TV shows are about. But when you've got people claiming this is high art, this is the, the most well-crafted television they've ever seen or some of the most well-crafted television they've ever seen, I think that rightly gives people like me the license to push back a little bit and challenge that assertion and raise some questions which I think uh, would really challenge the notion that this actually is like some of the most well-crafted TV we've ever seen. Don't don't get me wrong, there are moments, I think, of in this show, there are moments of what you might call artistic flair and nice little touches. We see little things like arriving at a house at the end of an episode and, and seeing uh, the table and the furniture and the house um, coated with dust and, and all that sort of stuff. These nice little flares, competent craftsmanship, if you like, that appear throughout the episode. Not everything about this is terrible. It's not, it's not uh, an absolutely poorly crafted cheese fest, but here are some things that stuck out to me which challenged the assertion that this is some of the most well-crafted TV. And as I said, some people might say, well, this is a bit of nitpicking, isn't it, Brennan? But I think some of this isn't nitpicking. It actually speaks to what is supposed to be the writing and particularly the characterization of the people who appear in this episode. So first of all, we have the conversation at the beginning with uh, Ellie and Joel where Ellie is asking Joel about what caused the apocalypse and uh, the, the great zombie plague that uh, they find themselves living under. And straight away, this seems like a rather odd question to me. I know why it's in there, because they are trying to give the audience and newbies like me a bit of an expositional dump to try and explain how this happened. The funny thing is we don't really need to have this explained to us. It's kind of obvious what's going on from the first couple of episodes. There's no real uh, questions that I had where I was going, oh, I don't understand how this happened. It's obvious what's happened. Uh, they do a pretty competent job at the very start of the first episode uh, of explaining the parasite and the, the cause of this zombie apocalypse, and then we see it all unfold. There was nothing that, for me, left me going, I don't understand, there's major questions here, there's big plot holes. But for some reason, they felt the need to give more of an explanation, to give a bit more exposition. But the way they do it just felt so clumsy at the beginning when Ellie is asking Joel, well, what caused the apocalypse? And the reason why that feels clumsy is, and Joel even actually acknowledges this when he asks, well, you know, don't they teach you this stuff in school, is... Clearly, this is something that probably most people would know. If you've ever been involved in a natural disaster, I had the uh, misfortune, if you like, of being involved in a natural disaster about 11 years ago, a major earthquake. And what happens is when you're involved in something like that, all of a sudden you learn very quickly about causes and risks and all of the things associated with earthquakes. You actually, you, you if you like, the law of, of quakes, uh, just like the law of this zombie apocalypse, you would know that stuff. It seems to me this is the thing, probably the one thing that people would be talking a lot about. There would be a lot of conversation about it. There would be a lot of awareness about it because this is the thing that has created the brand new world that they now find themselves living in. And this world presents a whole lot of new dangers that didn't exist before. So it seems to me that people would actually be highly aware. And it seems strange that someone would be asking questions like, well, how did this all happen? I know why it's there. It's an expositional dump. And it's fine if you're watching average cheesy television drama. But when you start claiming this is some high art and it's the most well-crafted stuff we've ever seen, I think it's worth pointing out these kind of things. Another question that struck me straight away in the show, and remember, I'm starting with the smaller stuff here. I want to I want to move my way up to the bigger stuff. This is not all just small nitpicks. But little things like when I saw that they had built themselves a wall of cars, 
on one side of this uh, gated community that uh, Bill and Frank have built for themselves. Uh, we'll come back to that whole question of the wall they've built later on. But when I saw that uh, wall of cars, my first thought was, well, how did that happen? How did they do that? It's just two blokes and really only one of them is actually competent in this world and that is Bill. So how did they end up with this wall of cars? Now I can understand cars being towed there by the Chevy truck or by the tractor. I can understand them being put together side by side, but when you start piling cars up, that requires a little bit more uh, machinery to do that kind of thing. And all it would have taken, I think, was a brief glimpse of some machinery that maybe could have explained how that happened. Now others might not have noticed that, but for me, it was one of the first things that came into my mind when I saw that stack of cars was about three or so high was how did they pile up those cars and so again I wouldn't be highlighting this this does feel to even to me like a little bit of a nitpick but I wouldn't be highlighting it if it wasn't for the fact that there was all of this grandiose talk about how this is one of the greatest and most well-crafted television episodes that anyone's ever seen in the history of television it's something that I'm sorry, I find myself disagreeing. Uh, the other thing that really struck me too about this world was the booby traps. They feel a little bit elaborate for the situation that Bill finds himself in. Now I get it, they are establishing the fact that he's a very competent survivalist. But surely, if you know anything about survivalists, I'm not one myself, but I understand that world and I've met some people who very much are uh, a part of or, or who have a mindset of that sort. And I think you could probably rightly describe survivalist thinking as like aggressive bushcraft. These people understand that you need to do the fundamentals well if you're going to survive in a hostile world. And the fundamentals of defense, it would seem to me, is not constructing a hurricane wire fence, which could easily be pulled down if someone rammed through it with a vehicle but the, his basic defensive perimeter is gone at that point and creating all of these uh, individual elaborate booby traps while they are fun in a sense to watch and there's a certain um, appreciation we get for the man's engineering skills the sort of fundamentals are missing and they seem like rather elaborate ways and the more elaborate something is the more likely it is to fail on you uh, a booby trap tends to be something surely that works really well once but if you're confronted by a group of people, which we're told in this episode is the risk here, it seems like that's not the best solution. And some of the fundamentals are kind of missing here, like rather than a very basic, flimsy looking hurricane wire fence, why wouldn't you try and build a moat or pile up cars earlier, whatever it is that you're going to do that's just a bit more substantial. It kind of feels uh, a little bit inconsistent here with who this character is supposed to be, which raises the question, why didn't more people find this place? And, and we know that raiding parties are a real threat. We are told by Joel. Joel warns Bill specifically about this threat. So clearly raiding parties are a thing and they are a serious threat in this universe. It's not just uh, dumb roaming zombies that are the problem here. So why didn't more people find this place? It just seems kind of odd that uh, Bill is the only guy to have survived. And, and suddenly all of a sudden, Frank is the second only guy to have survived, that no one else has found this place. There are indications that this little township they are living in is not actually that remote. And with the whole concept of raiding parties, it seems likely that people would have found this place. Again, these things are not unusual in typical, cheesy, average TV drama shows. And I think this is what this is. It's an average, typical TV drama show. But when you talk this thing up and claim that this is some of the most well-crafted TV ever, then I think you've got to account for this kind of stuff. Like, for example, how did two blokes, one of whom we know is practically useless in the necessary skills that you need for defense, how did they manage to defend what is a very, very large area ultimately with just two guys and some booby traps? It seems like this needs to be more well thought out again. This universe, and in this episode, we are explicitly told that these raiding parties are a real thing. The birds and the strawberries, that strawberry scene, which was all about hallmark sentimentality, emotionalism, and not really much else. So the first thing that struck me about that strawberry patch scene, and the several things that stuck out to me about that was, number one is, where was the netting? Now, if you are like me and you've ever grown strawberries, you know that one of the things you've got to do with strawberries, among 
uh, you know, keeping a careful eye on them. And there's a bit of uh, attentiveness and uh, labor that goes into growing a good strawberry patch. But aside from that, one of the things that you know you've got to do is you've actually got to cover your strawberries with netting because the birds love strawberries, especially bright red ripe strawberries like that. You walk away from a strawberry patch like that and very quickly the birds are going to have a, a lovely dessert and you're going to be left with not much else. So that stuck out to me straight away. Now I know some people might say that's a nitpick but again I wouldn't be doing this if I wasn't hearing all of this talk about how this is the, the most well-crafted television I've ever seen. I'm going to keep coming back to that point because I think it gives a justification for some of these critiques that I'm putting up. The second thing and this actually this is where it starts to get a little bit more uh, challenging for the characterization, I think, is that what you've got is a heavily armed, weapons skilled, if you like, survivalist. A guy who knows guns, who clearly has all these skills. He's the guy who is attentive to detail and to the detail of this world, the important details. He even tells us this in the final letter that he leaves for Joel. This is Bill. Bill is the character who is keeping both of these guys safe. He's the one with the skills. He's the one with the attention to detail. He's the one who doesn't take risks. He is very aware of his surroundings. His situational awareness is always like right up here. It's presented to us consistently in this episode. And yet Frank is able to take one of his guns supposedly and trade it without him knowing. And before you say, but Brendan, maybe he only traded it last weekend. No, we are told that these strawberries that he uh, was able to grow as a result of stealing that gun and trading it was that those strawberries had come from seeds. And seeds for strawberries require a lot more time. And so that really stuck out to me. It was like, why didn't he notice that one of his guns was missing? And if you know anyone who owns firearms, you will know that they are very particular and they're very aware, particularly this guy would be. His characterization is so clear. It's not questionable. This man, attention to detail, and survivalism, that's his thing. And that's how he is crafted in the show. And so all of a sudden that gets switched off just so you can create this hallmark moment. And so you've got uh, a problem now with the characterization, a conflict, if you like, that exists there. The other thing, of course, that struck out to me was why didn't Bill notice the strawberry patch earlier? You see at one point that they are reasonably close to one of the perimeter fences uh, with the strawberry patch. And clearly Bill is going to be a guy if he's a survivalist who's worth his salt, and again, absolutely, his characterization is crafted well in this regard in the show that he is a survivalist, he has an eye for detail, and he is aware of his surroundings, he's going to be walking that perimeter regularly, at least probably once a day, just to check everything is as it should be, that things are in order, that the defenses are there, and they're not going to fail them. And it seems unlikely that he wouldn't have noticed something like a strawberry patch before that. Again, maybe... I'm being too nitpicky here, and so I might want to accuse me of that, but this is me pushing back against this claim that this is some of the most well-crafted television that I have ever seen. Now from here, the, the hole, the next hole, this is quite a big one for me, this I think is a big challenge to the characterization and the structure and the writing of the show, and that is when Bill gets shot trying to fend off the raiding party that has come to their little gated community. So the first thing that stuck out to me was why is he standing there with a bolt action rifle? We know this man has military style weapons as part of his arsenal. So why would he be standing there with a single shot bolt action rifle? Part of me wonders whether, is this something I'm missing? Is this a, a, a trope from the game about his character? Or was this a political decision? Did someone decide, well, we can't have this character who we're trying to present as the hero of the show. We can't have him standing there with a military style semi-automatic rifle because that might glamorize military style semi-automatic rifles is there some sort of anti-gun politics going on here i don't know but the point is we're showing these weapons he uses what would probably not be the best weapon in fact it wouldn't be the best weapon that he has available to him in this particular situation and then even worse than that though he's standing there out in the open with absolutely no cover everyone can see him and he is shooting at a group of armed men. This does not make sense for his character. This is not good writing. In fact, that whole little action set piece, if you want to call it that, was pretty average, typical TV drama action set piece. 
wasn't high art at all. The way he gets shot even, it's all very average in the directing. It's clear to me that the director of this episode, action and action scenes, is not his strong suit. But the point is here you've got a character who is a survivalist, who is a weapons expert, who's got all the right weapons, who has crafted for himself this carefully crafted world of defences and alarm systems and booby traps. And yet what is missing from the scene? Basic cover of some kind. It seems to me that a guy like this would have thought about this. It seems so obvious and it stuck out to me like the proverbial on a dog straight away as soon as I saw that scene. I was like, why does he not have some sandbags somewhere? or a car, or a vehicle, or something that he has set up, so he's got basically like a trenched, covered type position that he can defend people, or defend himself against people trying to get in from and through the main gate there. It just didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Why has he not got a tower of some sort? Maybe a second story window somewhere, which allows him to defend his position a lot safer than simply standing in the middle of the road and shooting a bolt action rifle at a group of armed men that was always going to end badly for him and what it does is it's not just a, a technical flaw if you like this is not nitpicking i think this actually speaks to a writing flaw which undermines his actual characterization in the show where he is this fastidious weapons expert survivalist guy and then all of a sudden he starts acting like a yokel who's just been handed a gun and is panicking and, and sort of blindly firing out into uh, thin air where everyone else who's armed and who's, you know, he's trying to face down can see him and is easily able to shoot back at him. This doesn't make any sense. Now, the only reason it's in there is so that he can get shot. This is average writing. This is almost a, a deus ex machina moment. It's an attempt to create a scenario where he can get shot because they need him to get shot, and I think there's a reason why. We'll come back to this later. I have a sneaking suspicion that that shooting scene where Bill is shot and Frank is the one who, uh, you know, cleanses his wound and puts the bandage on and all the rest of it, um, is I think that's there because there's a major problem with um, Frank's character, and they had to try and address that in some way. And this is their small attempt. I don't think it's enough, but I think this is their their very small attempt to try and give Frank a bit more than sort of, uh, I guess, the he's, he's the dead weight in this relationship and in the story, basically. He's the guy who is obsessed with uh, boutiques and outfits and, and wine shops and stuff like that, which is not actually what they need in this world. He's the guy who is the risk, if you like, in this whole scenario. And so it sort of felt like they were trying to give him a little bit more something to, to sort of bring to the table by doing this. But the point is that they had to have uh, Bill get shot and so they do this in, I think, a very um, poorly crafted kind of way. It seems to me that there were other better ways to do this that don't actually challenge his characterization, but they just, they were sloppy. And again, this challenges the notion that people are constantly putting out that this is some of the most well-crafted TV uh, that we have ever seen. Remember, this is a survivalist, a weapons expert who has built some very complex defensive traps, booby traps around the place, but fundamental basics like having some cover to shoot from he clearly hasn't even thought about in this scenario and of course for me i straight away was also thinking well where are all the other previous raiders and the raiders after this because they're there for a long time this this episode has these rather jarring jump cuts time cuts and and it, this is one of the reasons why i know this is sentimental hallmark type stuff it's not particularly deep people who are talking about how deep this show is it really isn't they they are little vignettes and the reason why these vignettes are vignettes is they, they do this jarring time jumping to create little vignettes. And ironically, that actually creates a false impression about this relationship because there are some other things that are on display in this relationship that are really not healthy at all. But one of the things that stuck out to me was they're there for a long time. We know raiding parties are a serious threat in this world. Did they kill all the other raiding parties? Did no one else ever get shot? Did they never think to strengthen their defenses? What about all that kind of stuff? It just sort of you know, did, did no one survive and go back and tell other people, hey, there's a really well-armed and defended uh, little gated community here in this particular location. We think there might be something valuable that they're hiding. Uh, we can see electricity. We can see they've got gas. So clearly they've got stuff that we would want. They've got fuel. They've got a fuel source. They've probably got food. We need to actually get into this place. It seems to me that word would have got around. But the, the show just ignores that. Now, again, average TV drama, it's fine. We don't care about the details. We know that average typical TV drama and its cheesiness and smaltsiness, it doesn't really care about those details. But when you're trying to tell me that this is the most well-crafted TV that you've ever seen, I think those details actually do 
matter. Now let's get into the problems though. The second big claim that is being made about the show, and this is where I think the problems get a lot deeper, because the second big claim that is being made about this show is that this is one of the most amazing love stories I've ever seen on the small screen, or some kind of sentiment along those lines. No, it's actually not. If you look at Frank and Bill's relationship and you turn off the blinders of sexual identitarian politics, and you just look objectively at what is going on, how this relationship starts, how it ends, and how we even at one point in the middle see Frank treating Bill, we see that Frank is a narcissistic, uh, and I would say it's abusive type behaviors that we see from him, who is actually using Bill, the other man. And meanwhile, Bill seems like a genuinely caring guy who is doing everything he can to keep and save and nurture Frank. This is not a balanced, equal relationship of self-giving at all. It just isn't. And you see this right from the very beginning. So Frank actually acts like a sexual predator when he turns up in that house. And think about this for a second. He turns up, he is with Bill for a couple of hours. More than once, Bill asks him to leave. Bill is clearly awkward. He doesn't like him touching his stuff and all the rest of it. But for some reason, Frank then immediately launches himself at Bill sexually with no prior indication that there was any sort of uh, romantic connection that justified this behavior between these two men at all. And he just launches himself at him. And even though Bill is sort of awkwardly withdrawing himself in this moment with a kiss, and clearly this does not seem as mutual as Frank imagines it to be, Frank then basically says, look, just go and have a shower because I'm going to have sex with you. Now, here's where I think people would see the problem. If they took off the blinders of sexual identity and politics of wokeism and everything else, and this was a heterosexual relationship, I think people would see the problem straight away. And I think the grand irony here is that a lot of the same people who are going, wow, this was just such a beautiful love story because of the sexual identity and politics in the love story, if they saw this presented as a normal heterosexual relationship, they would see straight away the problem. So imagine that Bill is not Bill, but Bill is Billy, a female survivalist, and Frank turns up, uh, Billy cooks him a meal, uh, plays a song on the piano, uh, gives him a glass of wine. The next thing you know, Frank has grabbed her and has started kissing her, has, has, has forcing himself on her. And then he's, and she, she sort of is a bit nervous about all this, does all the same things that Bill does. And then Frank says, go and have a shower because I'm going to do some sex on you. Right, that's, that's what this whole thing is. And then when they are in bed together, when... When Bill says, uh, Bill is lying there and Frank says to him, look, I'm not a whore. Um, I, I don't have sex with people just for lunch. So I just want to let you know if we do this, I'm going to stay for a few days. Oh, okay. Are you now? So this is, you see, this is predatory narcissistic behavior right from the very beginning, which raises another really obvious and interesting question that no one seems to want to ask about this. So I'll put my neck out there. I'll martyr myself and I'll ask the obvious question. How the heck did Frank even know that Bill was gay? How did he know? He doesn't say it. He doesn't tell him. Frank assumes that he's going to have sex with this guy based on his behavior. But how does he know that this man is gay? And please don't say to me something cliched and trite like, oh, he's he's got gaydar. Don't you know gaydar's a real thing? I've learned about that from cheesy comedy shows where they have gay people and, and they taught me all about gaydar. <laughs> oh my gosh. So this is this deep, most profound, most well-written show, right? It's the most well-crafted television we've ever, ever, ever seen, featuring gaydar. Yeah, yeah, those two things don't really go together at all. And think about the supposed tells or signs that we are presented with that Frank would have seen, which presumably we're supposed to think has led him to judge that uh, Bill is actually a gay man, uh, let alone whether or not he's even interested in having sex with him. The assumption is, well, he's gay, I'm gay, of course we're going to have sex together. That's dysfunctional. That's not healthy human relations, if that's what you're trying to tell me. But first of all, let's look at the traits. Uh, so Bill is artistic. He's musically gifted. He's a foodie, and clearly there's an artisan quality to the food that he cooks, and he cooks well in the way he presents the food. He knows how to pair alcohol with food. He knows how to put the right alcohol with the right food, the right meats and the right wine together. 
and he pours the wine bottle exactly like someone who has been trained as a waiter or someone who is a bit of a foodie or a wino would know how to do. I often pour wine like that myself. Now, I tick most of those boxes. I am not the world's greatest cook, though. I am artistic. I am musical. Uh, Linda Ronstad uh, has written some great songs, and I love her music. I know the fundamentals of pairing alcohol with food, uh, and I often pour wine the correct way. That's the way you're supposed to do it, right? I know a lot of people who actually tick all of those boxes, who are blokes, they're heterosexual men, they're married, not a gay bone in their body. What this show is trying to tell you, though, is in the most superficial way possible, oh, you know what? Bill was clearly gay because he's artistic and he's got this sort of um, emotional side to him. That's what being gay is about. Now, I thought the whole point of what we've heard from gay activists over the last couple of decades is, in actual fact, that is a childish, simplistic, stereotypical way of uh, thinking about people who experience same-sex attraction. And the same with the whole thing of gaydar. It's this silly, nonsensical thing. But that's the supposedly the greatest love story ever told, the most well-crafted TV. Again, if you switch this thing to a heterosexual relationship, you see the problem. If Bill is actually Billy and Frank turns up and does what he does, you realize, and, and not just that, you realize, I think, that a lot of the same people, because of the sexual politics, who are going, this is the greatest love story ever told on television, would be, rightly, I think, decrying the behaviors. They would be pointing out that this kind of behavior is actually predatory. It's not loving behavior at all. Then we see a, a scene later on, a few years later, we have one of those jarring time cuts. And it's now the outdoor dinner party that Bill and Frank are having with Joel and Tess. And Frank turns to Bill, uh, well, at one point, well, he does, doesn't turn to him. He sort of, he directs a passive aggressive comment at him where he calls him a paranoid schizophrenic. And quite rightly, Bill is upset by being called this. He says, I'm not a paranoid schizophrenic and rightly so, because that is a rather derogatory and hurtful thing to say to another person that you're supposed to be in a loving relationship with. My wife would never talk about me that way, and I would never talk about my wife that way. Yeah, we have arguments, we have all the usual struggles, but if something like that happened in our relationship, that is a sign of dysfunction. That is not a sign of a loving relationship. That is not how genuine, loving people talk to each other. And for me, that insult dug a little bit deeper because my own father suffered from schizophrenia for most of his adult life. And I know how that slur is often thrown around and, and used by people who don't really understand a lot about schizophrenia and they misunderstand what it is. But to call someone that you supposedly love in front of another group of people, these other two people who are, they are strangers at that point, remember. And by the way, forgive the noise of the dogs outside. My new office setup means that you can hear the neighbor's dogs, which always seem to be barking. I don't know why, but 24 hours a day almost they're going. So forgive that noise if you can hear that, plus all the other noises that we get here, plane noises, cars in the background, stuff like that. Anyway, let me carry on. But supposedly in front of strangers, the supposedly loving relationship, and what do you get? You get Frank acting like a narcissist, and this uh, quite hurtful insult is thrown at this man who is pouring out blood, sweat, and tears to actually keep him alive and to, to keep him in the lifestyle of wine shops and fashion boutiques to which he has become accustomed. And this is what brings me to the major flaw in this episode, and that is the morally repugnant glamorization of suicide that this episode presents. This is not simply the stereotypical sort of liberal presentation of assisted suicide, which sort of downplays the negatives, downplays the ugliness of it, and tries to present it in a very sort of sanitized kind of way. This thing really turns on the glamorization of assisted suicide in a big way. And it's not just assisted suicide, it turns into two men committing suicide together. So first of all, and by the way, again, we see a moment here where Frank's narcissism in its most ugly form is on full display in this moment. So everyone talking about how loving this is needs to take a step back, turn off the uh, emotional brain, and turn on your reasoning capacity and have another objective look at what actually happens in these scenes. So first of all, yes, we know that Frank now has some kind of terminal illness. We are not told explicitly what it is. I'm assuming it might be ALS based on a couple of little things, the fact that he's got a sippy cup and stuff like that. It's, it's not clear what he's got, though. They don't elaborate any further on what exactly is happening here. 
The interesting thing, though, is if that is the case, then this is very stereotypical in these sorts of presentations where you want to put a positive spin on assisted suicide. What you do is you present the most extreme version of an illness to try and justify uh, the morality of legalised or the act of assisted suicide, if you like. But here's the thing. Despite the fact that he's got a terminal illness, he's clearly not in any sort of unbearable pain. This man is still living a meaningful life with his friend here, supposedly his friend, we'll talk more about that in a moment, beside him. His friend is caring for him. He's got some artistic ventures in his life. They are still dining together. They are spending time together. This man has no reason to be looking at his life and saying, there is no point, kill me now. The fact that he's saying that points to the fact that there is a psychological breakdown that has happened for this man. Anytime someone says, I want to end my life, we should rightly recognize that as a cry for help. But this show tries to flip all that on its head because it's desperately trying to glamorize assisted suicide. And in its attempt to do that, it just completely turns off the logic and the reality and goes into these truly morally repugnant areas, I would argue. There's this little moment of foreshadowing, by the way, I don't know if you noticed it, that actually happens in this episode. So earlier on, we see Ellie with that creature that is stuck on the floor and she opens up the top of its head and I'm reading into this, I don't know, I'm not a big fan of the game, so I don't know if there's some other thing I'm missing here, but I read into this that she has a knowledge or an awareness of where the right, uh, if you like, nerve centers, the, the important parts of the this uh, organism are, and so she's very precise, it's very surgical what she's doing, she opens up that part of the head, and then the creature, the human who has been overtaken by this parasite, looks up at her from the ground, go back and watch it again, I noticed it particularly on the second time around I watched the show, um, but you'll see that he seems to be giving her a, an agreeable nod, like, yes, yes, he's giving consent to being killed by the looks of it. And then she, boom, jabs him in the head and ends his life. And clearly, I think this is meant to be a moment of foreshadowing about what's going to come at the end of the show, where another human being turns and kills his friend. And so it was kind of interesting. And, and if that is the case, maybe I've misread that scene, but if that is the case, it, I think it only really brings home the flaws and the more sort of morally deficient nature of what we're seeing at the end of the show. Because really what's happening here is um, you've got Frank in his terminal illness who's experiencing some basic forms of disability. He's being presented like that parasite plant creature, that human being who is overcome by this evil zombie thing. He has no meaning, no dignity, no life anymore. That's the message at the beginning. And this is the comparison I think that they're making. They're trying to present to you this absurd and diabolical idea that you lose your human dignity just because you suffer or just because you experience disability. This is eugenic thinking about these particular very real world scenarios that people can go through. But here's the thing about Frank. He's not experiencing a situation anywhere like that guy stuck in the fungus at the beginning of the show. This man is still living his life. He just wakes up one morning and says, you know what? I don't want to go on living no more. So I'm just going to end it all. Wow. Stunning. Brave. It's not. It's not courageous. The courageous person leans into life, no matter the challenge, no matter the suffering, and they embrace it and they push back all the way. That's what the courageous person does. And other people around them still see their human dignity, even though they might be experiencing illness or they might be getting older or they might be experiencing some basic forms of disability, these people are still human beings. They still have the same dignity. But the message of this show is, well, no, in actual fact, if you were experiencing life in a wheelchair, you probably would be right to think that you'd be better off dead. Why wouldn't you want to end your life? It's actually repugnant, the message of the show. And then we get the big ending crescendo moment where, rather ironically, Frank ends this relationship pretty much the exact way that it began. This narcissistic behavior from him is on full display at the final end of the relationship. So he starts as a narcissist who forces himself on this man who's clearly indicated he doesn't even want him in his house. And then the show ends with him showing some very ugly narcissism. So he tells him, look, I'm going to top myself today. There's nothing you can do about it. So basically he ends up forcing himself on Bill once again. So what Frank does is forces Bill into a situation that Bill doesn't want to be part of. No, 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 I'm going to have sex, and so go and have a shower, and I'm going to have sex with you, right? That's where it starts, and where does it end? I'm going to top myself, and you are going to end my life. It's the same narcissistic behavior all the way through 
this particular character. And even think about the way he talks to him. He says, you know, you're going to give me one more good day. You are going to give me one more good day. I'll go and pick out the outfits and you will wear what I ask you to wear. You will cook a meal for me, right? And then you, this is the most toxic bit, then you will crush up all of these and he holds up the drugs, which will become his deadly poison, and you will put them in my wine. So this is all on Bill. Frank, the narcissist, is doing what he did at the beginning. He is using Bill. This is not the world's greatest romance at all, because then what happens next really exposes that lie. Bill, who is in tears, now turns to Frank and he says, I can't. In other words, you can't make me do this. No, this is not what I want to do. And Frank turns around to him like a true narcissist would, and he says, do you love me? And then Bill says yes, because Bill is a genuinely caring and self-giving guy. That's blatantly obvious. He's done so much for Frank. And then Frank turns around and says this to him, well, then love me the way I want you to. In other words, what he's saying, like a true narcissist is, if you love me, you will do this thing that you are uncomfortable doing because I want you to do it. That is what a narcissist does. They use the other person. Now, if my wife said that to me or I said that to my wife, imagine that same scenario. Rightly, my wife would turn around and say to me and I would say the same thing to her. No, you can't ask me to do this. And if you truly love me, then you would not try and force me to do something that my conscience tells me I want no part of because that is not love. But this childish, simplistic, emotive and uh, unsound, because it's not grounded in truth or goodness, this relationship plays out exactly as a narcissist using the other person. And then immediately what happens at that moment? Well, right on cue, we get the emotionally manipulative music. It's actually a very beautiful piece of music by one of the great modern classical composers working today, Max Richter. And unfortunately, not as much today, but previously it has been, I think, overused a lot in film and television, but they cue the Max Richter score to create the emotional swell. And what this does is it's causing people to turn off their brains. It's just going straight for the fifis, for the feelings. And that's why I think a lot of people have not thought well about the show, because there's a fifi overload in the show. And you're not really thinking, you're not really morally reasoning about what's going on. You're not thinking about the humanity or lack of humanity and what's going on. There's an emotional manipulation. So you get the emotional music. There's this emotionally manipulative imagery. This is the autumn of their relationship. Get it? They're out and the leaves are falling. There's an old house. It's just like their relationship, right? But this is largely unearned emotionalism. We don't really know a lot about, we know a lot about Bill. We've got a clear idea, I think, about who Bill is. Frank, we've only seen snippets of, and Frank's snippets are, by and large, Frank demanding things. Frank being narcissistic. Frank using Bill. That's, by and large, what his characterization is in this episode. And that's why I think they had that scene, that very cheesy and not well-constructed scene, where Bill gets shot. Because I have a feeling someone maybe pointed out or the person who wrote the show maybe realized, uh, maybe there's a bit of a problem here because, um, yeah, I need to give Frank at least one thing that he does that doesn't just make him look like the narcissist that he actually is. But this is largely unearned emotionalism. It is all manipulative sentimentality. There's little hallmark vignette moments, these massive time jumps to create little split-second moments or very brief sections of their relationship put together to try and create a, a big, massive emotional crescendo for you. We know now the writer of the show has come out and publicly stated, he's gay himself, and he said, I wanted to trick people into thinking that um, gay relationships are just like heterosexual ones. And it's not my words, that's his words uh, about what he's doing here. And I'm like, oh, well, color me surprised. I didn't realize at all that was what was going on. It was obvious that was what was going on here. And this is why there's this emotional sentimentality and this cheapness in what we see on display here. Then what you get is the scene where both of them end up topping themselves together. And this is where things get really, really troubling about all of this. So we know why Frank wants to end his own life. It's because he's got some disabilities and some reduced physical capabilities now in his life that he's experienced. And he's just decided that that's not good enough for him anymore. He doesn't want to go on living. 
So they've given us the reason why he's doing it. And then we discover that Bill decides to take his own life as well. Now, why does Bill do this? Well, Bill tells us because he's old and because this relationship with this guy is about to come to an end and he was the only meaning that he had in his life. And that, my friends, is a whopping great red flag for you. Because what that should tell you is that this man had no other meaning in his life. This is not a good thing. This is a man who is living a diminished human experience. He has no greater meaning. And this is one of the big difference between heterosexual and homosexual relationships. Is with heterosexual relationships, they have the natural ability to bring forth new life, children. And so what happens is this is a transformational event in the life of both men and women. It is the greatest school of love. And it makes you realize that there is a meaning beyond just your partner. And there is a meaning even beyond your children. There is a whole world out there. You realize this in very profound ways because of the gift of having children. Now, if you don't have that in your life, what you need to have is you need to have some sort of transcendent sacred order. You need to have a divine religious belief that is not some sort of self-centered spirituality, but a belief in something higher and bigger than you that makes demands of you that you give yourself to. And that way you have a sense of meaning that goes beyond just superficial things. And the notion here that his life would have no meaning now with this guy gone is absolutely, truly alarming. It is the same mentality which drives young people to do dumb things like we see depicted in the show. And by the way, that's another whole question in and of itself about the very explicit presentation of a method of suicide when we know we've got studies on this which clearly show that suicide contagion is actually a real thing. People see, people do. Vulnerable people see, vulnerable people do in this regard. It is not a good thing at all. But let's leave that aside for a moment. What we are presented here is the situation with this guy, this truly tragic and awful evil situation where a man believes that he has no more meaning in life. And then he also tells us that he's old. So being old in this, according to this episode, is a justification for ending your life. I'm old. Well, why don't we go around doing all the old people a favor in our midst and just start topping them? Well, we'll do that. We'll help them out. I mean, after all, Episode 3, The Last of Us, tells us this is a beautiful thing. In fact, it doesn't just tell us that this is a beautiful thing and glamorize it. We are explicitly told by Frank, the narcissist, that this is incredibly romantic. No, it's not. It's insane. It's selfish. It is narcissistic. It's hedonistic. It is people who have lost perspective, who have gone into their own little gated community of hedonism, where everyone else is excluded, and as a result... They have lost touch with the real world and they do something as dumb and as ugly as topping themselves together. Now you'll notice, by the way, that this episode doesn't show you the full fruits of what they actually did. It shows you all the nice, schmaltzy, sentimental, sanitized, beautiful fakery that's created around all of this. You know, Bill quickly puts aside his clear objection to this and realizes, no, the loving thing is actually to do what Frank the Narcissist wants me to do, which is to poison him. And as per usual, the relationship starts where it ends, where Frank is putting all of this onto Bill. So what happens is Bill will be the one, in theory, left holding the cup, so to speak, and probably literally too. Because Frank says, no, no, you will crush up the poison and put it in my wine. You will hand me the glass of wine and then you will take me uh, off to our bedroom uh, where I can uh, peacefully, in theory, we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, peacefully, I'll just shuffle off this mortal coil. And then you, Bill, will be left behind, not just to deal with the grief that I have deliberately and knowingly left you with, ending my own life, but also you'll be left to grapple with the psychological question of, why did I hand him the poison? Why did I crush up the poison? Could I have made a different decision? Could I have talked him out of that? This is Frank the narcissist. This is not loving. This is not good. This is not the most loving relationship I've ever seen put to screen at all. And that brings me to this other point about the huge liberal assumption. Aside from the fact that we don't see the graphic reality of it, don't go into the bedroom, we're told, remember, because you won't like what you see. That's the, the graphic reality of, of how these men ended their lives. You see all the smaltzy, sanitized, lovely, glamorized presentation of all of this. But here's the other thing, is there's this huge liberal assumption here that this will all go according to plan. You take the pills, you have a nice, peaceful, dignified ending. And we know that's true because that's what the ideology and all the pro-euthanasia activists, that's what they tell us will happen. But in actual fact, that is not the reality in an increasing number of cases now. And for those who are wondering, euthanasia is something I know quite a bit about. 
I have a background in bioethics. I speak regularly on these issues and I have been studying the euthanasia issue myself now for almost two full decades. And so I understand what's going on. I understand the latest happenings and events, wherever this has been legalized, what the negative harms and consequences are. I understand what st various studies are showing us about this, about the scenarios and how they actually play out in families and the way that the grief is different. There's a guilt factor that's added in there and all these complexities, these PTSD type moments that are uh, the survivors, uh, the family members who actually are involved in but don't get euthanized themselves, all this kind of stuff. And one of the things we know now is that there is a percentage of people who don't actually have a peaceful death. Some people it doesn't even work at all. Because one thing that can happen in a person's body is if they've been on a particular medication for a while, even opioid-based medications, is that what happens is their body can develop a bit of a tolerance. And so the high dose of these particular drugs that he's been on may not actually work according to the liberal fantasy. You may end up with a situation as well where even if they do work, his death is a rather drawn out and even torturous one because that's happening to people today as well. We've had cases where people have woken up and it hasn't worked. One famous case, the guy woke up and his wife says, I'm a dead. And she goes, no. And he goes, well, I'm not doing that again. And he died naturally, allowed nature to actually take its course uh, some months later. But the point is this. There is a conceivable scenario here that is really quite horrific to contemplate. And that is this. They go into that bedroom and Bill dies relatively quickly because he has not been taking these meds. And so he hasn't got any tolerance in his system at all. And the meds work as a poison in his system the way that they're supposed to. But meanwhile, Frank, this medication, this high dose of meds, doesn't work the way they thought it would because his body has developed a bit of a tolerance here. And then he wakes up and Bill is gone and he's left now to starve to death. Or maybe if he manages to crawl off the bed and make it to the kitchen, he runs out of food at some point that he can prepare for himself. And that's it. That's the end. So that's one very real possibility that could play out in this whole scenario. But you don't see that because this is a very sanitized and glamorized version. In a nutshell, to finish with, this isn't a world of love, I would argue. This is a world of, of self-love, of hedonism, of narcissism. This is Nietzsche's Ubermensch, the self-creating Ubermensch, who creates meaning for himself however he wants to. This is what this is. And the grand irony in all of this, I think, which is quite funny, it's not lost on me, is that they actually end up living in a very Trumpian kind of world. They build a wall. They exclude outsiders for the sake of resources and their own protection. And I know, I just know that some of the lots, in fact, of the same people who are praising this show and its amazing writing and message and love story and all the rest of it, if they stopped and thought about it, would realize, oh, well, we wouldn't praise that behavior if it was someone we didn't like, like Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis. Now, I'm not praising either of those two characters. I'm just pointing out the glaring flaws and inconsistencies in all of this. Here's the thing, because I would suggest to you that there are well-written TV shows out there, but this episode was not actually one of them. I think about, when I think about well-written shows, I think about things like The Crown. I think about things like Your Honor, starring Brian Cranston. Those are really, really well-written shows compared to this episode. This is just typical average TV drama that is being talked up by people because of the sexual politics or because of the emotionalism or because of some nostalgic commitment to the video game that I think is blurring a lot of people's judgment about all of this. It isn't great television. I remember when I first watched The Crown and I was very skeptical about The Crown. My wife had been watching a couple of seasons of it and, and I caught up with it late in the piece. I came to the, sh the show The Crown late in the piece and I thought, oh, this is just going to be a very schmaltzy, sort of cheesy romantic drama involving the royals. No thanks. But I decided to give it a watch. And you know what? I was really pleasantly surprised by what I actually found in that show. There are some really well-crafted episodes. There is some really good writing in that show. And what it does is it gets to the heart of the human experience and human struggles in a truly authentic kind of way. Now, you think that wouldn't be possible because this is about a royal family, a family of power and privilege, the elite of the elite in England, if you like. But despite all that, the writing is so good, it manages to take this very elite, privileged family and 
draw us into the realities of the human experience that we all experience, these big questions. There's some really quite amazing episodes. That is great writing. Episode three of The Last of Us is just a typical serviceable type TV drama episode, which was deliberately written with an agenda in mind. And it does show. We know that. The, the guy who wrote the episode told us that he wrote it. He had an agenda. And it's, it was all about sexual politics. That was what was going on here. But here's the thing. I would like to put a challenge out there to anyone who happens to watch this. And I don't pretend to be above my station, but if you do happen to watch this and you write TV shows or find yourself writing TV shows or stories in the future, here's the challenge. Write well-crafted male friendship and bonds of brotherhood that don't involve sexualizing the relationship. You see, all of this talk about how amazing and profound this was, I'm sorry, but a truly outstanding and well crafted moment of storytelling would have actually presented a platonic friendship between these two men. But the show couldn't do that. It took the easiest route possible. It actually turned it into sexual politics. It was an agenda. It was preaching. That's what was going on here. The, the, the writer of the show has told us that. I'm not making that up. I'm not assuming that. He's told us that's what he's doing. He had an agenda. But good storytelling, what it would have done is it wouldn't have taken the easiest route possible. The easiest route possible to try and explain intimate connections between two men is to sexualize the relationship. The reason we don't write intimate male friendship and bonds of brotherhood very well today at all is because our culture doesn't know how to do that. It's so hypersexualized, and sexual identitarianism is so great and we're so hypersexualized by the likes of Wilhelm Reich and Freud and co that what we don't understand now is how male friendship can be a profound and deep form of uh, and very emotionally tied brotherhood that doesn't have to be sexualized. You see this all the time with superheroes. You know, are Bucky and Captain America going to get together as lovers? Why? Why do they need to do that? Oh, that's right, to satisfy your ideological sexual fetish here. But it's because you struggle to actually, and I think part of it is because our culture doesn't even really understand the fundamentals of masculinity. And so it struggles to even put two men together in genuine bonds of brotherhood where they form that deep and meaningful intimacy that men can form, particularly in situations of crisis, which isn't sexualized. Heck, this show couldn't even form a basic bond of friendship between Joel and Bill. They had to sort of joke it off at the end. I don't really like you, but you're okay. I respect you. It, it, it couldn't even do that well. A good show would have created a profound moment of platonic friendship between these two men. That would have been a whole lot more interesting and that would have been a whole lot more better in the writing. Imagine this, uh, Frank turns up, Bill sends him away. So he gives him a meal and then he sends him away. And then as Frank is departing, Bill has a pang of conscience and it would probably, to give it a good solid motivation, it would probably have to be related to something that happened in his past. So maybe he had a brother that he didn't treat well and something bad happened to that brother and he blames himself. And that moment flashes back in his mind and he thinks, uh, I've got to make up for that. I've got to do the right thing. And so he calls the guy back and he says, look, you can stay one night. And he gives him a place out in the barn somewhere. Then put him in his house because he's a survivalist, remember, he's paranoid. He's not jumping into bed with some rando stranger who he doesn't know anything about. That's not how a survivalist would act. He would act with a lot more paranoid caution. He would actually put the guy out in another house somewhere. And he would give him the basic accommodation somewhere else. He would probably have all his doors locked and he'd have an extra gun out that night just in case, right? But then what happens is the next day something happens, a catastrophe of some kind happens because you've got to give a motivation for how these two end up sticking together in the relationship the bond actually forms in such a way that Frank is invited to stay in Bill's world. And so what you do is you have some sort of catastrophe that Bill experiences the next day, some sort of accident or something where he is badly injured and Frank actually has to initially save his life and care for him over maybe the first couple of days where he's unconscious. And then for the next few weeks, about a month or so, he needs to recover and he can't do the fundamentals anymore. And so it's not a matter of whether or not he wants Frank to be around now. The motivation is very clear. He can't actually live without Frank because Frank is the only one keeping him alive and keeping him safe now. And so what happens is he has Frank there to care for him and to nurture him. And over those weeks of his recovery, they form this intimate bond of brotherhood and friendship that is meaningful and real. It's not sexualized. It goes much, much deeper than that. Frank is not a narcissist. 
Frank is someone who genuinely loves this other man and cares for him with total self-sacrificial love. And through that, Bill's eyes are opened that the stranger is not a threat to him and that they can actually uh, live together and they can form a genuine friendship and this world would be much better with that gift of male friendship in his life. And so he comes out of his recovery and now he realizes the two of them are actually they're better together and the bond carries on from there. And then you could still, maybe if you wanted to, you still have the plot uh, with Frank getting some sort of terminal illness and dying before Bill. But what I would have, instead of this narcissistic, repugnant glamorization of suicide, what I would have is I would have Bill caring for Frank. There's a there's a beautiful sort of um, uh, simpatico uh, symmetry to this relationship now, where it starts with Frank caring for Bill, who is, who is unwell and who is dying, and it ends with with Bill caring for Frank, who is unwell and dying. And he gives of himself and self-giving love is this total sort of complete self-giving love now in this relationship. It's real, it's genuine. There's no, if you loved me, you would poison me. It's the kind of care that shows his human dignity still matters and that he still has meaning and he still has a place in this world regardless of disability or illness. And then Frank dies, he buries him, he gives him a proper burial, a proper memorial, a proper headstone. He does the things that human and uh, humane death entails. And there's something really beautiful about all of this. And then you either have the the meeting between uh, Ali uh, and Bill happening, or if you wanted to, Bill could die prematurely. And the way I'd have that happening is I would have Bill basically dying of a broken heart. Not a sexualized thing, not an act of suicide, but a broken heart, where his best friend in the whole world, this man who was a, a brother to him is gone. And so we really start to see as he contemplates after Frank is dead, just how meaningful this gift of male friendship was for him and what it did for his life. And then he quietly goes to bed one night and, and he doesn't wake up or something like that. And you realize then even more just the depth of an actual fact, what was what this gift of male friendship could actually be. There's something there that's authentic. It's authentic self-giving love. It really is meaningful. It's not the hyper-emotionalism and sexualization of our age. It's not identitarian sexual politics. It's not people grounded in their feelings. I feel this was loving. No, no, objectively, there's behaviors that are not loving at all in this relationship. Love is a concrete, tangible action in the world. It is the act of self-giving. And that's the one thing that is noticeably absent from this episode. He could write a beautiful letter which uh, is then received by Joel. And in that letter, what would make this all the more powerful is he now has the, the moral uh, kudos and credit and mana, if you like, to be able to actually challenge Joel about maybe his own selfishness and give a really deep and meaningful motivation to why he should care for Ellie. So he gives him a man-to-man -man challenge, basically, like a father would to a son or a brother would to another brother, where he says to him, look, I wasted so much of my life living in the survival of the fittest mentality where it was all about me. Don't do that. You need to risk. You need to give yourself in self-giving love to other people. Seek their good and your life will be better as a result. Now that would be profound television. That would be courageous. That would be going against the grain and that would be a lot harder to do. And that would be really, really well-crafted TV. And one final thing, because I know some people are saying, oh, but Brendan, this all needed to happen because he actually needed a motivation to carry on the journey with Ali. I'm sorry, that's just not correct at all. The only motivation he really needs is to get a battery and a vehicle so he can carry on the rest of the journey. They've set everything else up for that to carry on and to happen. There's no way that any of this backstory, this filler episode, the way it's presented, aided in any meaningful way to giving Joel motivation. I'm sorry, that is that is the thinnest of reasonings and, and, and it's the skimpiest of, of motivations that you could find. It just isn't. Everything else in the episode is set up for this to happen already. And ultimately, all he needs is for her to be with him on that journey. Once he's got the battery in the car, he can, they can carry on. And you know what? The version of the episode that I presented to you just a moment ago, that would actually give a more meaningful motivation. That would be a game changer. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you agree with me that even if you disagree with the conclusion I've come to, that I've made my case in a reasonably reasoned kind of way. If you enjoy this kind of content and you want to see more of it, support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash leftfootmedia. I've got lots of other content that is exclusive for patrons that I put out on there, weekly podcast, 
um, other episodes and other things that are only available to patrons. If not, the very least you do, please hit that little subscribe button and keep checking in. Make sure you click on the notifications bell. And uh, whenever I put out a piece of content, I would be greatly appreciative if you did me the favor of giving it a bit of a watch. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed the content. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time on Left Foot Media.